what I'm going to ask now is if the, the three professors could come and uh, join me again uh, on the stage. As a person who isn't uh, a, a historian of science, I just found those three presentations absolutely fascinating. I'm sure we all did today. I'm going to allow myself one brief word before I uh, ask for questions from the audience. Uh, on my right, there is a, a dictionary, which is called the English Arabic Dictionary. And what I suggest one of the outcomes from today might be is that uh, Professor Shear gave a very interesting dictionary halfway he, through his presentation of Arabic words which are used in common parlance. And I think what we, perhaps we ought to do is produce a one-page dictionary which we ought to send to every editor uh, of the British and American and European press when they're dealing with populist thought and ideas. But thank you ever so much to our colleagues. Mm. What I'd like to do, please, if I may, is to ask for two questions to start off with. If you can, uh, if you can indicate if you want to speak, if you could just say who you are, uh, and if you can identify perhaps which of the three professors you might like to answer. Uh, so I'll do two questions to start with. And then we'll see how it goes, and we do another two and another two. We, um, I'm delighted that uh, our professorial colleagues have almost spoken to time, so we have a little bit of time for questions. Uh, perhaps colleague right at the back, and then you, sir, at the front. Karen Pinto. Um, I'm your resident crazy map person. I'll be speaking mm -hmm. this evening. And um, I have worked with Ekmel Adin Bey, and I'm a great admirer of uh, Charles uh, Burnett's work, and it was wonderful to hear Professor Shear. So I'm going to address my questions to all. I was very inspired by all the talks. Um, for Ekmel Adin Bey, I was thinking about what you were drawing. The questions very, I do apologize. Okay, I have, to be, I have to be very specific. Um, Selasa, uh, El Cine Selasa. I'm wondering uh, if there's any connection, really bizarre, because I'm thinking about this, with, uh, with uh, the name Selassie in the um, Ethiopian context. You know, very popular. I'm just, it just came to mind. Other questions came to mind, but that came to mind. Uh, Professor Shear, um, I totally agree with you, and my, co my talk later will actually follow up on the points that you're making. But I did, uh, you might want to know that I encountered a uh, someone in Harvard many years ago who was spending a lot of time, he had a big grant to uh, prove that the majority of words from the English language came from Arabic. So I don't know where he is now, but it might be something to follow up on with your one-page suggestion. Um, and Professor Barnett, um, very tough, you know, all truth is subjective. And uh, I was wondering if you could speak to the subjectivity of that quest. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to say, as a colleague here, I have the answer to oh. the first question, <laughs> <laughs> if you don't. <laughs> please. Please, um, David King, uh, the advantage of having a background in Semitic languages, uh, Haile Selassie means the power of the Trinity. Oh. Ah. And it, no connection, of course, it's the same word. Ah, thank oh, you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that's in Ethiopian is, yeah. is uh, thank, thank you. Yes, sir. You know? Yeah. Another question? Lady? Lady? Yes. My question is for Professor Esanoglu. Uh, you mentioned that about translations from uh, Western uh, European languages of scientific works into the Ottoman Empire was 17th, 18th century, is that right? Well, we have evidence from 16th century as well. Right. My, my question is one, uh, what, uh, what languages were, being, were they being translated into? Would they have been translated into Ottoman or Arabic? Professor Sangri, do you want to say? Well, uh, f the first question, uh, El Sine Selasa, this is simple Arabic, uh, two words, El Sina and Selasa, three mm. languages. Mm. So it's mm. Uh, mm. three of three languages that the Ottomans used. But when you pronounce it in the Turkish way, you say El Sine Selasa. Mm. Nothing to do with Haile Selasi. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Very simple and honest and uh, modest two words. Mm. El Sinam, mm. the ruler of Lisan, mm. and Selasa means three, so this is mm. three. For the translations, we have uh, early translations of geographical knowledge and usages of uh, European cartography, particularly Portuguese and Spanish. Uh, and this is made by Pierre Reis 
in, in his famous world maps and his, his Kitab al-Bahriya, which is a big compendium on, on sailing and on, uh, on uh, navigation. Uh, later on, we have translations from Latin to mainly Turkish and Arabic as well. But when you go from 17th to 18th century, Turkish, as I showed here, becomes very uh, widely used. At the very beginning, Turkish was not used. When you look to the 13th century, before the Ottomans came, there is only two books written in Turkish in whole Anatolia. Mm -hmm. uh, with the advent of the Ottomans, because the Ottomans considered Turkish as their official state language. Mm -hmm. And then they, they encouraged the people to write in Turkish, but the only production of Turkish started when Turkish developed and adopted, developed as a language of uh, scientific knowledge, and adopted the Arabic terminology. So it became, first it started with medicine, then mathematics, then astronomy, etc., etc. When we come to the 17th century, you find that Turkish and Arabic becoming near to each other. And then in the, in the 18th century, Turkish becomes more than Arabic. Persian was there in the first century because of the influence of those who came from Samarkand after the death of Ulubi. And they were given uh, asylum and patronage by Sultan Mehmed II, the conqueror. But from 16, 16, 17, and after 17, there is no French text. Uh, sorry, Persian text. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Bridges. It's Kazuan Bridges, and I'm a professor of medicine, so I don't do anything in history. So I am only an amateur. <laughs> Um, thank you very much for all. I've, uh, Dr. Osaka, I want to ask you one question. When I notice in from your um, slides about uh, one of my interests, by the way, is the movement of the books, you know, from so immigrations in today's term, of, it's very common. Uh, and one of the things which I notice in your oral tables is that there are very few books have actually came from India. And the reason I say that is that I have studied Sharh Tashrih Kanun Le Ibn Sina for Ibn al Nafis. And there was about seven manuscripts which I found in different uh, libraries. Most of them, and all of them, has been written or transcribed in India. So, why very little books be moved to uh, Istanbul from this? Uh, from India? Yeah. Mm. Well, uh, India was uh, far away, and it's. Uh, was not, it was only it was only the other way around. The books written on medicine, Ottoman authors, like Sharh al-Mulakhas Ibn al-Nafis, and many other books, were used in India in teaching medicine. And you know, in the, even in the 20th century, there is a classic te teaching of classic medicine in India, no, known as Yunani, Tabbi Yunani. Mm -hmm. And the famous Hamdard Foundation, the two brothers, Hakim Saeed, Hakim, uh, Hakim Saeed and Hakim Muhammad Saeed and his brother, their brother, two of them. And they were using Ibn Dicina's books, Ibn Nafis books, and many, two, three Ottoman uh, texts. And these texts were first printed in India. And until two decades or so, they were used. And I've mm -hmm. seen the people using them. Uh, Hakim Hamid, Abdul Hamid, the brother of Said. He was in India. Two brothers, for instance, the two last representatives of Tubi Yunani. One, they are from India. Uh, so one stayed in India, Hakim Hamid, and his elder, younger brother went to Pakistan, Hakim Said. And his daughter now is still in charge of this Hamdard Foundation. They teach Tabi Yunani, what they call Tabi Yunani, which are Arabic texts, written mainly in the classic period and in the Ottoman period. Thank you. Professor Al Hassani? Yeah, thank you, Salim Al Hassani. Um, <coughs> I, uh, through, I'm, I'm still a young student in history, and I have, uh, because of my engineering background, I like to see things in order. 
and it's very difficult when you look at historical timelines and geographical distributions. And so my question is more towards uh, historiography. Uh, uh, is it, how valuable is it to, or, or how truthful it is to say that knowledge, uh, particularly or in, in science, is cumulative, it goes more or less linearly in time from one culture to another. And hence what we have is almost like a smooth uh, transfer between cultures. And what we have today is a, a collective accumulation of various contributions distributed in time. In other words, what we see, for instance, in um, Al Jazari uh, in mechanics, he had relied on previous uh, knowledge uh, and, 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 and so on. But the fact that Al Muradi in Spain and Al Andalus had, uh, for instance, preceded him, and yet he has not referred to him, uh, how does that uh, come about? How do you interpret history when you have? Uh, you guess that there was some connection because of the work itself, but there is no proof of contact or there is no proof of transfer between one uh, event and another. Thank you. If, if I may, I mean, that's such an important and general question. I'm going to ask each of the panelists to answer, if, with your permission, please. So, Professor Sheik, could you s say a few words? <laughs> Well, as, uh, uh, as always, uh, Salim puts his finger on the uh, broader and more difficult problems. It is true that there is a rupture in our age between antecedent work. Because in the past, you would look back to see what has been done. Now, of course, one uh, goes online and sees uh, what has been written on the topic that interests us. But there is a feeling in many fields that uh, innovation has been so <coughs> great that you do not have to have to go very far back. And I think that is a, also a very important cultural rupture, I, I would use that word, and not feeling that you have to go back and look at the history of mechanics to do the work that you as an engineer are doing. And, and mm -hmm. I think this may also explain why history has lost some of its importance. You, uh, if you're a mathematician, you go back to the great mathematicians. But if you're an engineer, to the best of my knowledge, you start where your professor stopped. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Thank you. Please. Well, I would like to understand the question in a different, or uh, to try to answer the question in a different way. Now, take al Fazari. When you look to the content of his book, it tells you that he has relied on previous material and that he hasn't brought anything new in his book except repeating what has been said before him on the same subjects. Did he use Benno Musa's book? Did he use Greek translations which we don't know of? Or he was helped by somebody else who had accumulated certain resources? So it, it, is, it is not easy to make generalities on, without studying many details, many detailed examples and copies uh, and turning points in the history of certain discipline. Uh, in these 20,000 or 22,000 copies which we examined during the Ottoman period, you have many references to old ones and re the omission to others. So the references to the old, the previous ones, and they revered them means that they have seen these books and they benefited from them. And the omission is because perhaps they didn't see them because it is not uh, available in soft copies the, on those days, 16th century, 17th century. There was no photocopy machines. There was no public libraries where you go and uh, it was a different world. 
So I think it, uh, we need to uh, specify more uh, about the problematic of the question. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, if we generalize things, we will be misled in uh, different directions. Thank you. Professor Burnett. Well, just very briefly, um, in fact, you see the very opposite in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance when um, authors actually emphasize the importance of the tradition of what they are writing about, even if it's not exactly correct. I mean, I'm thinking of a the, uh, work by Symphonie Champier, who was working in Lyon in uh, 1522. He wrote a book called the, um, the Golden Books on Medicine. And he says this is the information that comes from the, um, the Greeks, the Latins, the Arabs and the Phoenicians, and of course, uh, by Phoenicians, he meant uh, the Arabic doctors work in Cairo mm. and in Tunis. So that, uh, um, but it's very important for him to say, well, I am the inheritor um, of several important and ancient traditions. Thank you. Professor Gamati. I mean, I'm also not a historian of science, but I'm a scientist and a practicing scientist. And, and I my sympathy with uh, Professor Al Hassani here is about the word historiography. Um, if you are inventing and publishing a patent, there is something which is called prior art. Mm. And the patent um, uh, officer will throw back the uh, application. If I don't, and I have several mm. of these, mm. if I don't write them all mm. acknowledging those mm. who have come mm. before me, um, in the other hand, if I'm writing a paper and just ignoring the literature before th whatever I have seen or my students have seen, again, the referee will remind me that that is not right. I've got to acknowledge others who have come before me, even if I have to have a quantum leap and saying, by the way, so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so have written so-and-so, but I differ with them, mm. and here is my evidence. Mm. I've got to acknowledge them. Mm. And hence, the new look of historiography is a bit biased, if not confused, in my opinion. But I'm here to be corrected. Thank you. I, if I may, I'm going to take that as a statement rather than the question, uh, because we are running out of time. I'm going to take two more questions. Gentlemen there and then there. My name is Rashid Masoudi. Uh, I would like the panel, and perhaps the professor here in medicine, to tell us whether there has been any, shall we say, interaction between William Harvey and Ibn Nafis in terms of blood circulation. Is there one colleague who wants to speak? Well, we let's take questions yep. related to the subject. Okay. Um, my name is uh, Subhi Al Azawi, um, architect. Um, may I ask about acknowledgement? Like, why is it that the Greeks did not acknowledge the Babylonian heritage? For instance, the so-called Pythagorean theory was actually known in Mesopotamia 1,900 years, 1,300 years before the birth of Pythagoras, who was born in 480 to, and died in 400. And the British archaeologists discovered a tablet which shows that the, that the, uh, um, uh, the Pythagoras, so-called Pythagoras theorems was actually known in the year 19, 1900. And that tablet was actually established to be the homework of an eight-year-old child. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to take one last question, and I'm going to ask each of the professors to come through. Gentlemen there in the uh, dark shirt. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm John Hobson. Um, I'm from the University of Sheffield. I teach in politics and international relations, but I do a lot of world history. And I became very interested in this subject about 15 years ago. My question is to Professor Sanyolyu, which is um, usually we're told, from what I understand the literature, that uh, Arabic and Persian civilization produced all these wonderful ideas which then went over to the West to help the Renaissance and the scientific revolution. But we're always told that it kind of stopped around 1600, which is why I'm particularly interested in what you're saying because you're taking it up to 17th, 18th and 19th century. So my question is, did the Ottoman scholars work with European ideas? Did they develop them further? And if so, did, they, did those ideas then go back to Europe to enable scientific revolution to develop further? Thank you. So the three questions were as Pythagoras, question on blood, and the, and the question on the 16th century divide, if you like. I'm going to go 
through. Colleagues don't have to answer all the questions, but perhaps if you can just give a comment on, on any of those which is appropriate. I think I'll hand minutes. those questions on to my neighbour. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> William, do you want to say anything? Uh, I think one of the answers was provided by uh, Professor Isanulu. We don't really know exactly how. Don't forget that Euclid is, uh, is a textbook. I mean, you know, the, uh, that all, uh, it's a great textbook. Yes. I mean, if he was living today, he would be a billionaire. I mean, it's <laughs> when you write a textbook, you don't put too many footnotes. And that would be one of my tentative answers. Uh, uh, it's not really not very satisfactory. But may I uh, um, take the liberty of saying that I was traumatized this morning slightly by my friend Charles here when he talked about Veritas Arabica. I have a very limited knowledge, as uh, it's quite obvious. However, I have looked at the Latin translations that were made, and I tend to believe, I stand open to correction, that there was a little bit of exaggeration in uh, that veritas. If you look at the translations from Arabic to Latin, there are sometimes they are slavishly literal, and therefore they are uh, not at all capturing the truth. If you'd mind to comment on that later. We'll Thank you. <laughs> we'll, we'll do that later. Yes. What I'm going to do now is uh, unusually, I gave Professor Sangalu the first word, and I'm now going to give him the last word in the session before we have some coffee. Uh, so, mm. please, do you want to uh, well, comment on anyone or all of Just those questions? Just two remarks. First, uh, we should not judge scholarship in 16th century, 17th century, 18th century with scholarship of the day. That would be uh, anachronistic, you see. Uh, so, we have to think of the moods of scholarship, ethics of scholarship modalities of a scholarship on those days and they have uh, well established ethics and they have well established norms of, of that and traditions which we know of. Uh, the, the other point of the gentleman over the 16th century you see in the beginning of my remark I said that we were always all of us were under the influence of the founders of this discipline history of science particularly Islamic Arabic side the first pioneers like Aldo Mili, um, George Sarton, etc., they all emphasized on the first. Aldo Mili's book goes only to the 11th century. Sarton considered the golden age and he forgets about the rest. But we know from different disciplines, history of different disciplines, that this has, and the texts published related to 12th century, 13th century, 14th century. And we know from the history of Samarkand Observatory of Ulube in the 15th century that it was there is a lively, very dynamic and very advanced scientific discoveries, activities, observations of celestial uh, corps. And we know the same for 16th century observatory uh, of Istanbul and Taki Din's work. So now we have to correct this. Secondly, as I made reference yesterday to a lecture given here by Professor Saliba, that the commentaries which we know of or which we found out doesn't mean that it is a repetition of the tec original text. It means an opening horizons, advancements. But we are all for under conscious of this golden age. Ibn Sina, Ibn Rushd, Farabi, etc., etc. Even Isfazari was not known for uh, many people. Uh, and there are greater people than Isfazari that we know of them, but we don't dis study, like Takid Din, for instance, Ali Kushu, Mirim Chalabi, and many others. So we have to change our. Tid and I think now, because of the last 30 years' wor work of the Ottoman something. By the way, the librarians here kindly put five, six volumes, so the, those would like to mm. consult and see the volumes there outside here. Uh, we have to correct our information. And now we have access to uh, 20, more than 22 copies of manuscripts, 20,000 authors, uh, 20,000 works, and uh, about 5,000 authors. And I think we 
as we do monograms on different scholars and different scientific problems, we, our ideas will change. Good. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, just before we, we, we close the session, if I can say a, ver a very few words. Um, I'm afraid we've slightly overrun, so I've abused my position as chair. I hope you will uh, accept that the presentations were so important that it was the appropriate thing to do. When I came into the building this morning, I knew today was going to be a very important day, but I think what we've had in these three presentations from the three professors uh, has set us up onto a very, very good course uh, for the rest of the day. I think it's been excellent. It's been an excellent start. Can I thank you all very much indeed in the usual way? <laughs>